I grew up in a cult-like family in the backwoods of the Ozarks. My mother believed that she was ruler of the world, sitting on the right hand of God. We weren't allowed to have friends. We were told if we told anybody who we really were, we'd be killed. We got this daily programming from all of this. And then my father was quite violent, physically abusive, and also sexually abusive. He raped me from the age of nine to about 12. Hello, Merle. Uh, thank Hello, you for, <laughs> for being here. Um, if you want to kind of just give us a little bit of an introduction into yourself, what brings you here in life uh, and what you're up to today, uh, that would be wonderful. And then I can kind of start throwing my 20 questions at you. And we can... <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to meet you uh, and to share my story with you and your audience. And uh, I look forward to this. So who am I? Uh, God, do we only have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> you are here, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm a licensed psychotherapist in uh, Southern California. Uh, my journey to becoming a therapist was an interesting one in that, like so many, I'm what we call a wounded healer. We come from our own wounds and healing, and then that leads us to helping others, knowing that that recovery, that healing, that claiming your life is possible. Uh, and that's a message that can never get out there enough. Um, I grew up uh, in a cult-like family in the backwoods of the Ozarks. My mother believed that she was ruler of the world, sitting on the right hand of God. And uh, we got daily missives, and we weren't allowed to have friends. We were told if we told anybody who we really were, we'd be killed. We got this daily programming from all of this. Uh, and then my father was quite violent and quite physically abusive and also sexually abusive. He raped me from the age of nine to about 12. Uh, and so this wasn't much fun. <laughs> and uh, the, that's the short answer. Yeah, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. The uh, the worst in many ways for me was that the the rape was so violent, and I was literally being suffocated. That that causes dissociation and occluded memory in my case because it was the only way I could survive it. And so I had all of this symptomology of being sexually abused, and I was dissociating right and left for years, years, decades, if we figured this out. And uh, I guess I'll tell the short story of this, is that I'm a, I'm a trained EMDR therapist. I was trained by Francine Shapiro in 1993. And... Um, and the very first training, after they teach you the basics, then they want you to practice. And so they had us break up little groups and they said, pick a small T trauma. Don't pick a big T trauma because we don't want to open up a can of worms. <laughs> and the only thing I could think of was my, my atophobia of tall buildings. I'd look up at tall buildings and I just about pass out. And so about, we set it all up in about 30 seconds, probably into doing the bilateral stimulation. All of a sudden, my head went back, a cock went down my throat, and I completely dissociated. We now know, of course, that popias are often the cover for trauma. Uh, and so I learned that out the hard way. <laughs> and uh, But <laughs> even though I had been in therapy a lot of years, that was the a game changer because all of a sudden, a lot of things made a whole lot more sense. We didn't know what was causing all the dissociation and all the other stuff going on. Uh, and the sexual compulsivity is classic for sexual abuse survivors and all of those different pieces. But this changed everything. And it really was, while I had done a lot of work on myself, this was when the real stuff happened. And as dramatic as my mother's stuff was, and that was, it was a whole nother crisis in its own thing to grow up so isolated from the world with no social skills and, and all this other stuff. So it made my integration into the world a very 
difficult experience. And I didn't understand why I was so weird and everybody else acted so differently. Uh, but a lot of work, a lot of therapy, uh, and a lot of practice and stubbing my toe and just sticking it out there in the world and seeing what was going to happen. And healing happened. And uh, along the way, it got really clear to me that that there was something that I had to offer here, that my learning to heal or going through my healing process, that I wanted to go find out what it was I was really doing because then I could help others. And it really, it was amazing. Uh, of course, I took a three-year master's and there, as I often tell my clients, there's more fun ways to be masochistic. But. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, well, first of all, thank you for, for sharing that with us and so many possible lines of inquiry with that. I guess the first question I had was, can you talk a little bit about sort of as a general thing, male sexual abuse, particularly in young children, how that's sort of, it really is not discussed much at all, if at all, and how the sort of secrecy and the shame of dysfunctional families uh, keeps people trapped and how it's never so precise, I guess, but the moment upon which you sort of aw awoken or, or realized like all the shit that you had sort of experienced and like how you were drawn to heal or change or address everything. Now, there's, a, there's like three questions in there. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. all right, yeah. let me start with the sexual abuse. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, please. <laughs> um, the official statistic that, that's bounced around is that one in six boys and one in three girls are sexual abuse victims or survivors, whatever word you want to use. And uh, I believe actually the boys get sexually abused more than girls. And there's now growing data to support that because the simple answer to that is that girls are generally protected more than boys. And boys just get sent out into the world. And then they encounter all this stuff and they're supposed to be able to protect themselves and all this. And then they don't talk about what just happened to them. And it's just this whole set of dynamic. And sexual compulsivity is a result of sexual trauma. And you have all these men in the world who are sexually compulsive and don't know how to stop that because that's your first experience of sex frames how you're going to be sexually. It sets the program for your sexual experience of being in the world. And so men who are sexually abused as boys, as so many of them are by their babysitters, by their female school teachers and their male school teachers, and, and particularly the boys who don't have a great relationship with their father, are particularly susceptible to men paying attention to them and giving them the attention they're not getting from their dad. And so then these things happen and they don't know how to talk about it. They, they were programmed. I mean, the moment a little boy it pops out that he's told that his job is to take care of his mother, <laughs> he's not allowed to be a little boy. And right. so he's supposed to be a little man. And, and it's just a setup to be victimized because you can't ask for help. You can't say, this is hurting me because that means you're not a man anymore. And we're not allowed to just be little boys. And it's, it's criminal. And that's why so much is trauma and drama is going on with men in relationships and so forth, because it just gets set up. And then so many of them get emotionally incested by their mothers, which creates a whole nother can of worms. And I often say men who had good relationships with their mothers don't abuse women. <laughs> This pisses yeah. off a whole lot of people. Don't I really bet, care. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, ironically, in my case, my I have a twin sister, and mm -hmm. I have the middle child by 15 minutes. Uh, and my older brother, uh, a six-year-older brother, my brother was my mother's favorite, and my twin sister was my father's favorite. And I was kind of a lost child in a certain way. And that actually saved me in a whole lot of ways, uh, even though I was sexually in, uh, molested by my father for a long time and brutally. Uh, and mother, and once my brother fell out of favor, suddenly I became the chosen one uh, to rule the world after she, she was no longer able to do that. 
And this is big, heady stuff for a nine-year-old. <laughs> yeah, okay. Were your siblings <laughs> abused as well? Uh, Sexually? Do you know? I do, uh, but I won't go into that because it's not my story. Yeah. Sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yes. Uh, yeah. And well, there was no boundaries in this household. I mean, my mother would sit around and bitch about dad wanting him to, her to suck his dick and how disgusting that was. And if you didn't want to get pregnant, just use the other hole and other fun little missives. This was just part of growing up in my family. And uh, it was pretty bizarre. <laughs> was, I mean, I didn't know that at the time. I, we right, were right, so isolated right. from the world. This was just normal. And, and then it took me years. I don't know if I'll ever fully integrate into society uh, in terms because uh, our childhoods really shape who we are. And that's why we have to spend so much time talking about that in therapy because we have to come to terms with that this wasn't normal or whatever normal is supposed to be. And uh, what may be a little T trauma to me may be a big T trauma to them. And, uh, and that's all that matters. This is that has to be addressed and healed. My major stick about this is that we've all been victimized. Nobody gets through childhood or life unscathed. But if you identify with the victimization, you're trapped in that time and place and you can't grow up, you can't heal, you can't be a full member of society. You have to take back your power and Stop giving it away to this person who did this to you, whatever that was. Yeah. And how did you start that journey? <laughs> I guess well, that was one of the second part of my question, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was a very odd kid, but I might not, might not be surprised. I really didn't fit. And so when I went off to college, I'll tell this short story. Is, is it, At my graduation night in high school, my twin sister was crying. And I said, why are you crying? She says, because this is over. And I said, hallelujah, I'm out of here. <laughs> she thought I was absolutely nuts. She still thinks so. But uh, I then left home, moved in with some, some – I was a D-Malay. That's the, the Boy Scouts of the Masonic Lodge. Uh, and I uh, moved in with a, some friends from that uh, to go to college. And so – and they said – we think maybe you could use some therapy. <laughs> and so one of them was in therapy with this lovely woman. And so I went to see her. And in the very first session, we're sitting there and she looks at me and we were all talking about it. She says, you seem really nervous. Am I, are you scared of me? <clears throat> I said, no. She says, well, what are you frightened of? And I said, what's inside of me? And I didn't even know consciously at that point what the depths of what was going on inside of me i just right, knew there was right, a lot right. going on inside of me i didn't know why because of the occluded memory uh and so that was really the beginning and i spent about five years there with her as my first therapist i think i did 17 years of individual therapy and two years of gestalt training program with intense therapy and that and a whole bunch of other stuff and so uh i did a lot of therapy but it was all really really necessary uh and it was a long painful journey but getting clear about the dissociation and what that was covering and starting to clear some of the occluded memory i never cleared it all because it was never the goal it was not necessary for me to remember every bit of the horror that happened to me and i had been mad enraged at my father for years and i couldn't figure out why i mean he was a violent asshole but I had no memory, literally, of what had happened to me. Uh, and so when this all came back, suddenly a whole lot of things made a lot more sense. But it was the, the task was to process the pain, to go through it, to feel it, to, to punch that pillow, to uh, say what needs to be said, and to take back all of my power from him. And I didn't speak to him for a lot of years. And in the end, I actually wrote both of my parents a letter. It says, I'm done. I'm not going to listen to your voicemails. I'm going to read your letters. I'm finished. Have a good life. I'm out of here. And I lived up to that to the very end when they're both, and they're both deceased now, which, of course, pissed my twin off. And, and, of course, I was the bad guy in the family. Not that I really cared. I really considered that a badge of courage and honor. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Uh, yeah. 
but you have to be willing to face the consequences of of facing your pain and part of that was my completely separating from my family so that i really could find out who i was in the world and not have to keep redefining myself around them uh and it was not always fun i was a bit strange uh, i think i'm probably always going to be a little strange but i was in a really wonderful 19 year relationship that was really healing uh and uh also my belief is, and I've seen this so much in my practice, that sexual abuse survivors find each other. Every time I see a man come with sexual abuse, his wife was sexually abused, or vice versa, and I was my, I'm a gay, uh, my partner uh, was clearly sexually abused as well <laughs> and would never deal with that, I might add. Oddly enough, here I am going through all of this, but you understand <laughs> that you can't make, make them <laughs> deal with their pain. Sure. Uh, and uh, it really hurt the relationship at the end a lot because I was doing all this work in healing and he wasn't. And eventually the gulf between us became so wide that I had to say, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And so I've been the one willing to walk away, whether it be my parents or my partner. Uh, but I've always felt that my job was to heal me. My job was to take care of me. And I, I guess I was a terrible codependent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I another badge of, of honor uh, yeah, yeah. because <laughs> because people give their power away all the time and then wonder why their lives aren't working right and right. and no and it's just not helpful <laughs> yeah yeah wow it's very touching uh where I'm just really again thank you sort of for that um I'm just noticing how I'm always touched by this, the language of courage and honesty and humility that's coming out in, in what you're sharing is really beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I think that was the, the first couple of questions were, were answered there. Um, maybe we haven't really also uh, acknowledged your book quite yet, uh, but that'll be also in the show notes for people. They can check out Facing the Truth of Your Life which I guess you kind of were just describing a lot of. Um, do you maybe want to talk a bit, yeah, talk a bit about the book and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, the book is, uh, I call it uh, a journey through how you became you. <laughs> and it's really confronting. And it's as, it's as direct as I am. Uh, subtlety, is, I'm not known for my subtlety. I can get there when it's absolutely necessary. But I find it's generally a waste of energy. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you, sorry, to, I, to um, this is curiosity, is that somewhat of a Gestalt-esque approach? I'm not too familiar with Gestalt stuff, but it's, I do understand it to be a bit more direct. Oh, no question that it's direct. Yeah. I mean, Gestalt is the, one of the original body-oriented therapies. And so mm -hmm. it's about getting in there, feeling it, bringing it out into the open, exposing it, processing it, holding it, and healing it. Uh, and right. so, yeah, as a Gestalt therapist, I'm going to be much more direct about this because um, I'm unapologetic about facing pain. And I'm unapologetic about talking about the pain. And that, that gives the, my clients their freedom to talk about it because there's no shame in the room. There's no accusations and I can be outraged on their part. And to some degree that's modeling for them that, that it's okay to be angry at who did this to them because it's so hard for a child to be mad at a parent or to some other person who was a, a parent like figure in their life. And you have to take back your, your power. And unfortunately, our society has really set us up to give it away constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> and that, that can get into some of the other questions, but maybe back to the book. So facing the truth of your life, you were sort of saying you're very direct. I interrupted you about the gestalt That's curiosity. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really about taking an honest look at your life and seeing where the pain came from and what are you going to do about that? And hmm. uh there's some of it's really hard. I mean, I, I have a couple of 
shticks that really piss off people. <laughs> <laughs> Shockingly enough, uh, I don't believe in being a victim. Yeah. I believe that we've all been victimized, but to live as a victim is to give all your power away and to not get on with your life. Uh, and so I think that it's really imperative that you take all that power back. And by, as a consequence, I also don't believe in forgiveness. To I the self or to others or what? To or others. Or, yeah. Uh, to okay. others. Because I'm going to do the short version of this. I can do yeah, a long version. Yeah. But the short version is, is that your job when you've been victimized is to take back all of your power from that other person, to not give them any power to hurt you any longer. Forgiveness means absolution. That means you're offering them absolution for what they did to you. And I think that's not only bad for you, but I think it's bad for them because their job is to own what they did, apologize for it, and make an amends. That's the healing because you, you taking it all away from them as if they have no responsibility for this isn't healing them. And it's frankly not healing you either. Because how many people have told me, oh, I said I forgave them, but I never did. Of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you distinguish, I'm sorry to interrupt you, between, you know, the saying, you can forgive the person, but not the action? Can you, yeah, how do you sort of distinguish that? I or is that generally. mumbo jumbo or what? I think it's mumbo jumbo. I think okay. it's a lot <laughs> yeah. of dancing around and trying to rationalize right. uh, this right. judo Christian silliness around forgiveness. I said, Christ yeah. forgiving you, that's a whole nother pay grade. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and I'm not taking on the illusion that I'm Christ and that da 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 da. I'm not God. But uh -huh. my job uh -huh. is to heal me. Their job is to heal them. And part of their healing is owning what they did and making an amends and apologizing for that. Yeah. That is real healing. And you can accept or not accept that apology. That's fair. But that's their job. And if you let them off the hook, then nothing changes. And I also don't believe in self-love, mm -hmm. which also gets me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell because, us a bit more about that. Yeah. Because self love gets used like this lotion that you put on to soothe yeah, yourself. Yeah. And it doesn't change anything. It puts a little ointment on it for the moment. The task is self acceptance. I accept that I was fucked by my father. I accept that my mother was crazy and did all of this bizarre stuff that kept me from being having social skills and doing a whole lot of other things that happened. And all the other crazy times that I was brutally mugged and my head beaten and, and, and all the other fun things that have happened to me along the way in my life. And so I, I think we spend too much time worrying about other people and not enough time worrying about ourselves. <laughs> Can you distinguish? Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is beautiful. It's music to my ears. And, um, <laughs> I, I want to ask you the, I, I sort of, I think I'm on the same page with the self-acceptance self-love kind of stuff where does where do you see self-compassion fitting into that or or do you or or oh i you know? do you have to have compassion for that child that yeah. didn't know any better or that young adult who's out fucking everything he can get his hands on yeah. because <laughs> he's sexually compulsive trying to discharge this trauma inside of him it's the only way he knows how to do that we pathologize men in their sexuality but we don't understand that they've been traumatized by the whole society set up in a lot of ways. I mean, I've had these clients from Latin America and, and I've seen it happen in this country, but when the boy turns 13, they're dragged off to the whorehouse and made a man out of them. Wow. That is sexual trauma. He is not sure. ready to have yeah. that level of stimulation, especially from a partner who has a lot more capability of doing that. And that's why you see so much sexual compulsivity in Latin America, because it's baked into the system. <laughs> but we're doing the same kind of crap here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not as overt. It's just part of the culture there where ours is more covert. But we're traumatizing and children getting fondled by their parents in really bizarre ways or siblings. And I remember doing a, an intensive with a guy who was talking about at the age of eight or nine, he was looking, trying to figure out how to, to have sex with all the girls. 
And I said, well, your son is about the same age. Does he know about all this? He says, of course not. <laughs> I said, uh-huh. <laughs> so guys just normalize this behavior because they get lost in the pleasure of it. Yeah. And yeah. they, they, and we, when people are sexually abused, they uh, have, they are going to absorb the shame of the abuser. It's just part of the download of what happens. Uh, and also they, they have a choice of focusing on the pain or the pleasure. And most people are going to try and focus on the pleasure, assuming there's more pleasure yeah, no than doubt. pain. <laughs> and yes, uh, yes, yes. there often is. Uh, yeah. And so, but the problem is, is then eroticize the shame. Yeah. Can you like explain that a bit more? <laughs> well, sure. Cause shame is yeah. the, is feeling bad about who you are. I am sick. Yeah. I'm twisted. I'm a whore. I'm this, right. I'm that. Right. Right. It's an, right. I am bad statement. Uh, and that becomes your identity and it gets confused with guilt, which is a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> but, but, and so if you eroticize that shame, then you're going out there and recreating that over and over again. And if that's having sex with 27 people tonight, then that's, then you're going to be as bad as you can possibly be at bad because it both feels good and bad at the same time. And so, uh, and when children get sexually abused by adults, that gets normalized for them that this is how you're supposed to be in the world. And that's how we create pedophiles. And so we've, we set this whole system up and then we punish people for acting out on how they were trained as opposed to working on healing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I really get angry at how much men are pathologized and traumatized repeatedly yeah. for the things that happen to them instead of being often compassion, offered compassion and a path to healing. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> There's a lot in all of that, no <laughs> doubt, uh, personally and collectively. Uh, I love sort of a lot of the other topics you sort of talk about, and maybe we could move into that a little bit around sort of like boundaries. I I'm curious, we can just introduce the idea of like why people generally develop poor boundaries, but could you also kind of describe <laughs> the difference between sort of our own internal emotional boundaries and then sort of like physical boundaries out in the world? Oh, well, they're interrelated. It's <laughs> the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not, they're not completely <laughs> diametrically okay, yeah, uh, yeah, opposed yeah. to each other, but yeah. people we're really sensitive beings and we sense what's going on around us. We have these really incredible abilities that often aren't validated or, or people are trained to utilize in a really healthy way. Uh, and so we get confused about what our boundaries are. A boundary is simply where I stop and you start, period. It's no more complicated than that. And so there's the physical boundary, of course, which we all talk about, you're too close to me, <laughs> or whatever, yeah, which yeah, may very yeah, well yeah. be true, but we're yeah. probably ex responding to more the internal boundary at that point because right, we're energetically right, feeling right. intruded upon by them. Mm -hmm. They're too close to our space. And we're not taught, and this is even worse than the physical boundaries, we're taught that we can tell them that they're too close to move away, but we're not taught how to manage these energetic boundaries going on between us. And that's the, the primary thing that I teach is about these energetic boundaries, because once you learn how these work and how they function, it changes your whole life because you can keep them out. You don't have to let them intrude upon you. They're standing right here. You can still keep them out. And that changes the whole game. Uh, and it's, of course, we have to understand the physical boundaries as well. But, but if you can't distinguish them between the two, and understand what's going on, then you're just kind of lost in this soup and with no way out. <laughs> uh, and so it's really imperative to understand that we're energetic beings. We're made up of atoms. We're just this buzzing energy and they're buzzing energy. And so, and when you have this buzzing energy close to each other, if you aren't managing that, then it gets all mushed together. And guess what? We're, we're lost in their stuff and your stuff and you're absorbing their stuff and they're absorbing your stuff. And let's all have this big orgy of stuff. <laughs> and it's awful. I mean, uh, one of the things I talk about, uh, in the workshop a lot is, uh, 
compassion and, and empathy. Mm-hmm. And that our model in the world is to, we have to merge with them and feel their feelings to truly have compassion and empathy. Well, first of all, it's really rude. You're violating their boundary. You're jumping in them. And how many times have you gone to talk to somebody, you're upset about something, and you start telling them, and you end up taking care of them because they're falling apart? (laughs) (laughs) Because they've just absorbed all of your stuff, and they've not worked on their own stuff, so they're just collapsing. And so, like, go away. You're not helpful. But it's so real empathy, real compassion is about being a profound witness of the other person's experience and validating it for them. Yes, that really happened to you. Yes, that was really horrible. That's going to help them far more than saying, oh, I feel your pain. Well, no, you don't. It's their pain. (laughs) And it can trigger your pain. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. But that's a different thing. So, and with good energetic boundaries, you're not going to let it trigger your pain and you're not going to absorb theirs. Right, right. Yeah, that's a lovely description of, or at least how I understand and talk about a lot, self-compassion helps us draw that boundary, at least for me. Yeah. Um, But people are still trained to merge. Yeah. It's just like a default setting. And it's just... And therapists are terrible about merging yeah, because they agreed, haven't learned agreed, their agreed, own agreed. boundaries. Agreed, it's like, agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they wonder why yeah. they're intruding upon the client. Don't even understand yeah, yeah. they're intruding yeah. on the client. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, want to yeah. smack them upside the head yeah. and say, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, a really, yeah, that's a whole nother hour long conversation. <laughs> isn't it? Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a big one. Um, one way I, I think it's simplistic for people to understand is, they say compassion fatigue in caregivers or whatever, but it's empathy fatigue, right? It's more of a. It's, well, it's, yeah. You're absorbing all this other stuff, yeah, and you yeah, don't, yeah. and you're not discharging it in any way. And so, uh, I tell this story. Uh, I used to teach this as a full day, full day workshop, and uh, my my approach to boundaries. And this woman therapist took it, who I'm quite fond of, and she see like uh, thirty plus clients a week. It's not, I used to see that as well. But if you have that's good boundary, lot. you can do that's that. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And, but that's a lot. Though, and for sure. it is a lot. But she would come yeah. home at the end of the day and yeah. she'd be exhausted. And because she was yeah. seeing like nine people a day. And but she so after the workshop, she called her husband and said, I'm done with my clients for the day. I'm on my way home. He says, should I have your cocktail ready? <laughs> I said, she said, no, I'm okay. She gets home, walks in, and he says, you sure you don't need a cocktail? Because apparently this was the normal ritual uh, to recover from all this. And she said, no, I'm fine. I'll just freshen up, make dinner. And he looked at her and said, Merle. She said, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> once they learn how to do this, they're shocked that they can be present with their clients, be a witness to their client's pain, and appropriately empathetic in the right way as opposed to the wrong way and help heal them and be alive at the end of the day and have energy for their family and their selves because they haven't just absorbed all of this and they're exhausted from carrying it around. So I'm a big, big, it's a big issue for me because I just see it's so ingrained in our society and women particularly are programmed to give their power away at every moment and suck up all the energy in the room and everybody's stuff and then wonder why they're tired and exhausted and unhappy. And it's like, and then the men are, are completely disconnected. <laughs> and then, then they put them in a relationship and go, uh, what? <laughs> it doesn't work. So yeah. both of them with good boundaries changes everything because that goes to sex too. We have a whole conversation about sex is not about merging. It's about joining. <laughs> it's about making contact at the contact boundary, which is where the excitement happens. If you merge, you kill the excitement and you kill sex in the relationship. It's a great way to, to have a sexless relationship is to merge. That's interesting. Well, maybe I was going to ask you kind of how do you help people most with boundaries and, and to strengthen their boundaries um, and perhaps well, – for lack of a better word, enforce them. And then maybe if you could talk a bit more about that merging idea that you were just talking about. Okay. Well, I, that's why I teach the workshop. And so yeah. it started yeah. as a, a couple hour workshop and turned to a full day workshop. And then COVID hit. Couldn't do that anymore <laughs> in person. And so eventually I went online for a while. And so eventually what I did was I 
taken the whole thing and I've turned it into an online on demand workshop so that people can take through this. And it's, it's been split up into two major parts at this point. There are seven steps in it, but there are two major parts. Uh, and the first one is about our interpersonal boundaries and the, what we learn about this and, uh, and really taking that back. And, and I'm wondering what these really are about that learning about how, where you stop and I start and all this, mm -hmm. uh, and also how to say no without feeling guilt or shame and all these things <laughs> and going through all of those parts of this. And so it's a really intense uh, walk through your own beliefs about who you are in the world. And you have to go back and look at this in order to heal that. And then the, the other part is about energetic boundaries. And I, and I, from, I have a, uh, the first couple parts of that is about sort of what I call beginning energetic boundaries and how you learn about how these work and so forth. And then I get into the advanced stuff and you get into the really much more complicated things. But they're all grounded with meditation and learning how to stay inside of yourself and not be over there, but to be a witness to what's going on so that people feel seen. Uh, okay, so back to your other thing about merging. Merging is bad. There is only exception to merging. The only, only, only exception is a baby from zero to 18 months. The parents must be merged with the baby because the baby cannot tell them what they need or what's wrong. <laughs> right. From 18 yeah. months to three years of age, the parent has to withdraw. And at three years of age, the parent has to be completely out of there because otherwise they're intruding upon the development of the self of the child. And that's how we create a whole lot of disorders. <laughs> and so it's really essential that the parent, the problem is, is that too many people and mothers in particular, this may be the first time they've ever felt truly loved in their entire life is being merged with this baby who is unconditional love. And so consequently, they don't want to let that go. But it harms the child profoundly. And it can for the rest of their life. They may never get help for that. But it's just, it's, it's, and it's just how we're trained and taught. It's not that they're bad people. It's just they've not been t told anything better about how this stuff really works and how people really form and how you have to stay out of the way of that <laughs> to let them form. Forming a self comes out of the reflection they get back. Not the intrusion, but from the reflection. That's what we do as therapists. We set them reflect back their experience to them so that they can take it inside and solidify and hold themselves and actually see what's going on. That's the most important part of what a psychotherapist does. But if the therapist is merged with the client and they're this big goo of grossness, then it doesn't work. <laughs> Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Can you what can you sort of maybe give a couple examples of how these things play out in a relationship with people or whether it's romantic well, we, or familiar well, or, or even at work? You know, yeah. talk sex. I mean, it's a great way to kill sex yeah. because it sex happens at the contact boundary, that excitement of right. bouncing up against each other. That's that initial meeting with somebody. Ooh, you feel that chemistry. And yeah, oh, yeah. but if you glom onto each other, it's like you just killed the chemistry. It's dead. Uh, and unfortunately, because our model, I mean, our, the wedding song says two shall become as one. Our whole model of being in relationship is merging into one being. <laughs> And it kills relationships. It kills the love. And I yell about this all the time. And, and so many couples are meshed. And all I stopped doing couples there because I just got so tired of the level of pathology and the unwillingness to face it or deal with it because they're the problem. I don't have any contribution to this. And that mm -hmm. just gets really old, really, yeah. really fast. <laughs> but, but merging... It's bad for everybody. It's bad for, it's for the kids after three years of age. It's bad for the relationship. It's bad for the relationship with your family and friends, your boss. We, and the problem is, is that we are, our families, I call it our families teach us a dance of intimacy. And then we think that's the dance that the whole world is operating on. And then we take that dance out into the world and we recreate our family at work 
We recreate our family with our friends because we're just playing this out and we marry our parents because we're looking for somebody with that same dance and we find one, oh, it just feels so right. <laughs> well, congratulations, you just found dad. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm really, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so we just keep recreating the same pathology over and over and over again and wonder why it, it's not changing anything or why things don't get better. And then we divorce this one because we're tired of this. They're just like my father. I hate them. We're going to go find our mother now because we want to try and work on that one too. So, and I often say we're always going to marry our parent. Just one, try and pick a healthier version. <laughs> <laughs> It makes it a whole lot easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, am I answering your questions? I'm going spinning. Yeah, along yeah, really fast. totally. I'm no, sorry. no, it's great. It's great. I just reply. I was like having a moment of like, I think I married a healthier version of my mother. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least that's what I tell myself. No, um, well, I married a healthier version of my father. He did as well, but. The difference was that he wasn't willing to do his work in the end and yeah, that yeah, killed it. Yeah. Uh, but he was definitely much healthier version of my father. Yeah. I was a <laughs> very much healthier version of his father. So are you familiar with the Enneagram? I am. I haven't actually gone through it myself oh, or okay. like, yeah. But yeah. I studied with Helen Palmer a million years ago. So uh, cool. I know him pretty well. But, but we yeah. were the classic couple, the uh, six, eight couple. And, and, uh, so it was just so, it was so, we, we, we were soulmates. I mean, we met the first night he ever walked into a gay bar and three months later we were living together we were together 19 years. Uh, and he was really, it killed me to walk away from that. I knew I had to do it, but it was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. It took me five years to recover. It wow. was really, it was gut wrenching, but yeah. it was necessary. Yeah. And like uh, how. So maybe we, maybe the kind of, maybe any other topics we didn't cover that you want to talk about. And I'm curious, um, I guess, how you see spirituality fitting into all of this and maybe commentary on sort of our, at least in my opinion, or I am aligned with this uh, perspective of like the God-shaped hole in all of us, or particularly in Western culture, sort of this emptiness of spiritual connection or whatever it is. That's my you know, one way I would put it, but yeah. Well, I'm deeply spiritual. Uh, mm -hmm. I, even after growing up in a Christian cult, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Christian, by the way. Uh, yeah. Cause uh, I mean, I, I, that's a whole nother podcast. Uh, sure. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm, a, I adopted Buddhism along the way because Buddhism is the most aligned with this whole concept of, of energy and of of connecting with the divine but not merging with it per se mm -hmm. not in the sense of mm -hmm. losing yourself but it's but we mm -hmm. because we're seeing the reflection of the, of the divine within this within us it isn't about merging and so consequently uh, it really spoke to me on a really deep level of course back back in the I get what somewhere in the eighties, early eighties, I jumped in uh, head, head foot or head head first into the new age movement, and so that was the beginning. Then I went to a graduate school that was uh, transpersonally based. It was about integrating the spiritual with the uh, with uh, your psychology, and so and then so it just the, the Buddhism was a big part of that particular program, the, the path that I took, and so it just became really foundation of how I am in the world. But understanding those boundaries and understanding that we're part of everything like because we're all atoms but we're also mm -hmm. in this in this body we're separate at the same time and that's very confusing to people <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, it is. yeah yeah but once you experience that separateness and wholeness at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. it changes mm -hmm. everything and it also makes your relationship with you a whole lot better because then you're really attuned with you and at home with you and you can work through that stuff that that you before you were so merged into the masses of your family and the perpetrators and the violence and god knows whatever else happened merging that you had no way of stepping back in order to truly see it and the real healing happens when you take the step back 
and you're just in your space and you're observing where you were and where you are and you're observing them over there. That's where healing happens. Because you can have compassion for their journey and yes. their lack of awareness and compassion for your lack of awareness and how you got here. But it's but you didn't have to t own it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no matter how much, well, at least for me, the part of me or whatever, the language that comes up in my mind that doesn't want to, right? Or that continually tries to remind me why I don't need to or why it would be better well, if so I didn't. it's much easier or... to be a victim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. You don't have to take responsibility then. Oh, yeah, yeah, they did yeah. all this to me, so I have a get out of jail free card. I never have to get over it. <laughs> Do you, can you maybe, I don't know if you want to, but just how entrenched that is in our current social cultural climate and, and maybe how, if, if ever you've seen people come to the realization and sort of shift a little bit in that space or how do we, yeah. Well, our whole society is built upon who's the biggest victim. Yeah. We have yeah. competitions for, I'm a bigger victim we than do. you are. So we my do. victimization yeah. is more important than yours. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, un it's a disaster. Sick. It's it is sick. thick. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. a sick society that keeps replicating it because we keep victimizing people even more and then right. competing with them to be a bigger victim than they are. And it's like, Oh my God, this is insane. And when you don't play the game, it totally confuses them. Hmm. <laughs> they don't know mm -hmm. what to do with you when you aren't playing the victim game. And, uh, but if you really want to have a real relationship with someone, a friend, a boss, a partner, a child, <laughs> you have to be separate. You have to let them be separate. And you have to honor their pain and support them through it, but you don't, you can't take it on for them. It doesn't work that way. We all have to walk our own path, our own journey to our own healing. And we have to become whole that way. And I can talk about all of this I mean, every now and then I'll tear up for some reason. There's something that touches me about a memory of that child. But I don't hate my father. I don't hate my mother. I disowned them because they couldn't work on themselves. Uh, but it wasn't out of hatred. It was simply out of being taking care of myself and not having that constantly being thrown back at me and all this nonsense. And... And me being the bad kid because I'm the one who walked mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'll take yeah. that badge. But there's a price for healing. And that price can be really high. But I can tell you, on the other side, it's so worth it. <sighs> it doesn't always feel like it in the moment. Because you feel like you're losing so much, but you're gaining so much more by gaining a real relationship with you. A real responsibility for being in the world and owning your role. At the end of the book there, my belief is, and I'm not the first one to do this, but my goal each day is to do no harm and to leave the world a better place. And that may be as simple as picking up a piece of trash off the street or smiling at someone in the store. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it can change somebody's world in that moment. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. That's lovely. Uh, that seems like a good place to, to wrap up. Uh, I just want to, just for the sake of it here, put it, put your book up in front of the camera facing the truth of your life. And anybody, uh, again, as I mentioned, all that information will be in the show notes. Um, and any I, other, kind of, yeah, go yeah, for I it. I invite yeah. you to check out my, the, uh, boundaries workshops, mm -hmm. unspokenboundaries.com. Right. Uh, it's all on demand, uh, so you can do it at your leisure. I actually recommend, because it's so hard doing these on-demand workshops by yourself, yes, is that you is. pair yeah. up with somebody and both of you take it so that you keep each other on track. You have somebody to talk about what you're learning and you have this shared experience. You're in a group of people. That would make it, a, it makes it a very powerful experience and you can all help each other grow. 
Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. And that'll be included as well in the show notes. So again, Merle, thank you so very much. It's a beautiful story and message and certainly a necessary one. <laughs> we should be pumping out through the, what do they call those megaphones? Yes, um, I agree. It, uh, yeah. it seems healing is not understood. It's used as a cliche. It's diminishing yeah. things. And so when you can actually experience healing, it changes you and it changes the world. So I invite you yeah. to, the price is worth it, even though it may not seem <laughs> like it in that moment. And, but yes. finding the right therapist is a big part of it too. There's a whole yeah. chapter in the book about finding therapists. Nice. Uh, Cause uh, I have too many therapists. Oh, sorry. I'll show up here in a second, but yeah, do, too, do, many do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, too many yeah. therapists in my experience have never done their own work. Yes. yes they go yes, into yes. therapy because they want people to like them. And so they never challenge them. They never hold them accountable because they may not like them. Every narcissist I know who's a therapist has a full practice <laughs> because they're beloved. Their clients never get any better, but they're yeah. beloved. And they have this little gross relationship. And so as I did this for, for 19 years, 17 years in healing and some unbelievably profound experiences that uh, had me rolling for days in my stuff and just going through this. But I am who I am. I can say what I can say and own all of my past without being a victim and being fully alive. And there's nothing like it. And I highly recommend mm -hmm. finding your path to that place. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.